You are listening to the Maker's Church Podcast. For more information about our community, please visit makerschurch.org. So, so, so good to be together. If we've never met, my name's Derek, and I have the absolute privilege of serving here as the lead pastor. And as you can see, this is a really, really exciting time for us as a church. As we look back on all that God has done and as we look forward together to what God will continue to do through us. And so today we really begin uh, the beginning of a capital campaign uh, where we're asking all of you to partner with us and to really pray through and think about how God um, would have you partner with us financially above and beyond your normal tithe and offering um, to help see this come uh, into, into fruition. And so, thankfully, we're not going to talk about that all morning during the sermon. Um, it's going to it's going to touch on on some themes of this. But really, after the gathering is a reception in the hall that we would love for you to come to, where we're going to talk more details and and uh, the specifics around how the capital campaign is going to work. And so, if you're here this morning and you have an extra thirty to forty five minutes to come and hear more about that, we would love for you to show up to that. And we're going to do them after the gathering for the next two Sundays. So three in a row: this Sunday, next Sunday, the next Sunday. And then on March 15th is going to be our Commitment Sunday, where we hope that by then you've talked with your significant others in your, in your household, you've prayed, uh, and you've asked, how can you be part of this? And we're going to come together, and we're going to commit on March 15th, so that we can see how God can move through all of us to make this happen. And so if you've, if you've been with us uh, for a while now, you know that, that Here for Good is a theme for us uh, for this entire year. And this morning we're going to launch a series called Here for Good with the same title. Here for Good has been our vision for the year. But a vision at some point has to to take uh, form into a strategy. And part of our strategy is a a capital campaign to help renovate this building. And you're going to hear more about that at the reception along the way. Um, But this morning I really want to talk about, about leadership and about vision. And for the next four weeks, this is really a series and a conversation for you personally. I'm going to use what God's doing in our church kind of as the metaphor, as some examples of, of how this all works itself out. But really, this is a conversation for you to learn what God might be calling you to. What, is, what vision is God giving you for your life in this season? And we're going to do that by walking through the book of Nehemiah. The book of Nehemiah is found in the Old Testament. And it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fairly short book that I'm, I would love for you to begin reading and, and journeying with us over the next three to four weeks. And so we're going to get there in a moment. But really, like I said, this, this conversation this morning is all about leadership and, and therefore it's about vision. And I know that, that most of you uh, might not really lean in towards that conversation because the reality is, is that most people don't see themselves as a leader. But the reality is, is that every single one of you has the potential to be a leader. See, leadership is really simple. Leadership is just you taking the influence that you have, and you all have influence. You all have power. You all have an ability to to take that influence and use it to impact your world, whatever your world is. And that's the conversation that I want to have this morning. And if, if some of you are, are, are here and you're thinking, I'm not quite sure about that, I just want you to help think about what is your sphere of influence. If you're a parent, you have an incredible ability to leverage your influence to impact the world of your children. If, you, if you're a student, you have an incredible ability to, to leverage the, the influence that you have and impact your classmates in your school, a, a neighbor to impact your neighborhood, a citizen to impact your country, a congregant to impact your church. Whatever sphere you might be in, you have the ability to leverage that influence to make a tremendous impact. Now, if you're here this morning and you grew up and you were the star athlete, or you were, you were the, the, the head of the cheerleading team, or, or you are somebody here who knows that you're a leader, you, you, you're, you're quite sure about it, I, I want to encourage you this morning that God can even use you. And I want to I encourage you with that because if you've ever looked through the scriptures, it's actually highly unlikely that God would use somebody like you. Because God specializes in using ordinary people. And so if you're here and you used to be in the hero, there's hope for you. There is. There's absolute hope for you. 
If you, if you dig into the scriptures, you'll, you'll see the story of a kid named David. He, he was the least significant of all of his brothers, and as, as Samuel was looking to anoint a new king, he, he lined all of his brothers up while he was out in the field, and, and these brothers were, were tall and handsome and stunning and strong, and, and, and Samuel wanted to pick each and every one of them, but God kept saying, no, 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 no. No, I have somebody else in mind. There's a boy. He, he's a shepherd. He's not here. He's out there. And that's the kind of person that God calls. There's another moment in the scriptures where God calls, uh, calls Gideon when the Midianites are attacking the Israelites. And, and he calls Gideon out and Gideon says, how could you possibly want to use me? My, my tribe is the least of the 12 tribes and my family is the least of all the families. My clan is the least of all the clans and I, I'm the runt of the litter. And God says, you're exactly who I want. And as we, as we move through the scriptures, we end up getting to the place where we read this story of a, of a man named Nehemiah. And I, I want to give a little historical context to, to, to Nehemiah because I think it will really help us get our heads and our hearts around just exactly how God might begin to grow a vision inside of you. How is it that, that God could grow a vision inside of you and how can that vision shape the way that you lead an impact in your world? So the historical context for this, if, if you remember or if you, if you open the scriptures, you, you'll see a, a guy named David who was found as a kid. And, and there's an interesting thing where, where when he was identified to be the next king, he was anointed. But there was some time, there's a great time between the time he was anointed and the time that he was appointed. There was a, a gap in time between the time that, that he was marked and the time that he was released. And I know some of you are waiting for your breakthrough moment. And just because you haven't had your moment yet to lead or your moment yet to influence, I really do believe that God has anointed every one of you if you are in Christ. He's anointed every one of you to, to leverage all of the giftings that God has given you. And there's a moment in time where God's going to release you. And there's, if you look through the, the history, there's the, the time where David became king and, and God moved mightily through him. Even though he was a man after God's own heart, he was deeply flawed, like all of us. And God put a, a vision inside of David to build a temple, to build a permanent home, a place where, where, where the actual presence of God would reside, a permanent place where the tabernacle would, would stop being moved around and that there would be a permanent home. And, and God put that vision inside of David's heart. But if you keep reading in the story, you realize that even though the vision and even the plans for that temple were put in David's heart and mind, it was actually his son Solomon who would then go and build the temple. And I wonder how many times that God wants to start something in us and God wants to start something through us that we'll, we'll never see the fruit of. I wonder how many times we, we, we think, God, if this is the thing that you're calling me to and this is the thing that you want me to be a part of, how come I'm not seeing it happen just yet? And even when we look in the, in the historical context that's leading us up to this moment of Nehemiah, we see that God gave David a vision and he started working that vision. But it was actually the next generation that completed it. I think it's so similar to what, of the story that God's done here. Where God began a good work in this place over a hundred years ago. And now there's a next generation, a new generation that's being entrusted to us to carry on into the future. But not just for ourselves, but to prepare for the next generation. And if you keep reading the story, there's, you can see that, that after Solomon, the, 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 the lineage, it gets kind of wonky and haywire. And it all kind of goes to hell in a handbasket. And there's this season of debauchery among the children of Israel. And as a result of that, the kingdom is split into a northern and a southern kingdom. Ten of the tribes in the north and two in the south. Israel in the north and Judah in the south. And over the course of time, in 722 B.C., the Assyrians come in and they defeat the northern kingdom. And they, they take them captive. And, and shortly after that, a few hundred years later, in 586, the Babylonians come in and they defeat the southern kingdom, Judah. And in that time, they destroy the walls of Jerusalem. They destroy the temple that Solomon had built. And they take almost all of them away as captives to Babylon. Take them into captivity. If you continue to read through the scriptures in, in this season of 
time, you'll hear stories of a man named Daniel who ended up in a lion's den and God was with him and he shut the mouths of the lion. You'll read the story of Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego. And this is during the time of the Babylonian captivity. And they were in the fire and God was with them in the fire. These are the stories that are coming out of this time that's leading up into the story we're going to lean into for the next few weeks. Later on in 539 B.C., a new world leader came about, and the Persians, they defeated the Babylonians. And the Persians, although they were the new rule and they were the new kind of rulers of that world, they were a bit more benevolent than the Babylonians. And the rulers of Persia let some of the captives go back to Jerusalem, let them go back into their homeland. And this is the moment that we see Nehemiah come up in about 445 B.C., 445 years before Christ. And in that time, as some of the captives were released to go back, they they rebuilt the temple. And and it wasn't nearly to its glory that it was in the first time, but the second temple was, was rebuilt even in a time of oppression. And this is where the story picks up, and it, it, it steps into talking about this, this man named Nehemiah. And Nehemiah was, he was a slave to the king of Persia. And he was the cupbearer to the king. And if you, if you start to look at what a cupbearer is, it, it is he would, the king would drink the finest wines and he would eat the finest food. But his cupbearer would be like the, the guinea pig, the one who would taste the wine and eat the food just to make sure it didn't have poison in it. So while it sounds okay, it's kind of a death threat. And as it comes to, to being in captivity, he, 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 he exists and he lives as the cupbearer to the king and, and he only knows captivity. He's not just a slave, he's the slave of a slave who was the slave of a slave 150 years of slavery. He knows nothing else other than rumors of his homeland. And this is where the story begins to take place in Nehemiah 1, verse 2. It says, One of my brothers and some men from Judah came. These are some that had been released back to, to, to Jerusalem to, to, to go live there, and they had come back to his homeland or back to where he lived as, as a slave to the Persian king. He said, I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped and had survived the captivity. And about Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who survived in the captivity are in great distress and reproach. And the wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates are burned with fire. And when I heard these words, I sat down and wept. And I mourned for days. And I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And so here's this this guy. He's never been to Jerusalem. He's never been to the homeland. He's only heard of it from generations ago. And as as some folks come back in across his his sphere of influence, he he asks a question. In his own curiosity, he begins to investigate what's going on over there in a land that I've never been to, but that I know that I'm from. And when he hears the news, it it breaks his heart. Have you ever had your heart broken? I mean, it's it's one thing to have your heart broken by him or by her or by that circumstance or by that thing. But, But what I'm talking about this morning is when your heart breaks because you're compassionate and you're moved to care about someone or something that you really aren't affected by. If you think about the moment that he exists in, even though he's in captivity, even though he's a slave, he he lives in the king's palace. He doesn't have to care about that thing. He doesn't have to care about the thing that he can't see or the thing that doesn't really affect him, but it begins to break his heart. And as God begins to grow a vision inside each one of you, maybe you can start by realizing the things that your heart gets broken for. The things that you're compassionate towards. The things that you really shouldn't have to care about, but, but you do. 
And if you read the rest of this story, you, you realize that he goes to God in prayer and, and becomes so courageous towards the vision that God begins to shape inside of his heart that he goes to the king with absolute courage. And he says, I need a letter that lets me go freely through the land. I need to go back and I need access to your forest. I need you to make me the governor of Judah so that I can build this place. Oh, and by the way, you need to taste your own food for a while. He becomes so emboldened by this vision that God puts in his heart that he courageously asks for the impossible. And if you read the story, it goes on to say that, that after 150 years of the walls being torn down around Jerusalem, and after a new temple being rebuilt and at risk because there was no safety around the city, that he marches back towards Jerusalem. He goes to Judah. And in a matter of 52 days, he rebuilds the walls around Jerusalem. And I wonder this morning, what could God use you to change? I wonder this morning, what vision can God put inside of you to make you so courageous and to be so emboldened to perhaps do the impossible? Oh, and by the way, to bring others with you to help make it happen as a leader. I wonder what God would begin to grow inside of you if you began to ask him. See, I think that, that for us to get our heads around really what is vision, we need to understand that there's a difference between purpose and vision. See, purpose is the thing that never changes. It's the thing that you were made for, the thing that you were called to. And you, could, you can begin to know your purpose by getting closer to understanding the very heart of God. And if you have made a decision to follow Jesus with your life and, and you spend some time understanding the heart of God, you know that the that, that two things that, that are worthy of giving your life to are what we call the Great Commandment and the Great Commission. To spend the rest of your life trying to figure out how to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and to love your neighbor as yourself. That's a purpose worth living for. To be also called to the Great Commission to go as a follower of Jesus and be entrusted and emboldened to go and make disciples, baptizing the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey the things I've commanded you. See, that not only is, is a worthy purpose for your life, but it's the purpose of the church. It's the purpose of the church. But vision is different than that. Vision is about the thing that God's doing in this season that will help you live your purpose out most fully. It's about the next right thing. The, the, the vision is ever-changing. It's the thing that God calls you to in this season. And for this season, for us as a church, we know that God has, has kind of shaped a vision for us that, that is encapsulated by this theme here for good. And already, even as we begin to speak that theme over us as a church, it's taken on more meanings than we can even count. We know that, that here for good means that, that we, as a church that's been migratory for so long, we found a home. We found a place to, to, to exist in and to build from. And that we're here for good. It's a statement, a declaration that, man, this is where we're going to be. And we're not going anywhere. And we're going to do as much good as we possibly can while we're doing it. And if you were here for the first few weeks it just, it just, uh, of the year, it, the meaning just keeps growing and growing and growing. And I just keep hearing story after story about how this theme is taking shape in your own life. And how it's inspiring you and encouraging you to take great risks, to, to live boldly and to live loudly, to learn how to live self-sacrificially in so many different ways. And it's been amazing already that God has taken this vision for our church, and even begin to make it grow a vision for your personal and individual lives. And that's what I'm inviting you to this morning. To spend time over the next 30 days, to go on a 30-day journey with us, and to go before God in prayer and pray this prayer. God, what vision can you grow in me? What does it mean for me to be here for good? Or maybe it could be as simple as this. God, give me a vision. 
give me a vision for my life. And to spend the next 30 days asking God that question. I'm so curious to hear how God will move. For, for some of you, it's going to be to, 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 to place your faith in Jesus, to make Jesus the leader of your life. Many of you are in here, and you're not quite sure about what that even means, but you've been here on a journey. Maybe this is your first time, and you're going, I don't really quite know all about that yet, but I'm intrigued. And maybe that's, that's the next vision that's God gonna, that God's going to give you for your life. Maybe for you it's going to be to start serving and start giving your life away, whether it's here or somewhere else out in the community. I mean, maybe for you, you've, you've made that dis- decision to follow Jesus, and it's time to make a public declaration of that through baptism. Maybe it's to start going to a community group, or maybe it's to start giving financially to the Here for Good campaign. Maybe it's to, to quit that job or to start that business. But I absolutely believe that if you, would, if you would go before God and pray and say, God, what vision would you give me for my life in this season, that God will answer courageously, and he'll do so by breaking your heart for something. See, every great leader has a vision. And I believe that, that, that vision kind of comes into view through about four different lenses. Have you, many of you been to the eye doctor lately? Anybody? And they'll put these different lenses in front of your eyes and they'll say, How can, can you see now? Nope, okay. And they'll put a different lens in front of it. And can you see now? Uh, not quite. And then they'll put another lens in, in front of you. And all of a sudden, you can see. And there are different lenses that, that, that line up, that come together to help you see that. And I think the first lens that will help us begin to, to gain a vision for the next season for our lives personally is to begin to see what is. To see what is. And in our Here for Good theme, that the word here has really encapsulated that, that lens. To, to be here, to be present, to have our eyes and our ears and our hearts open to what's happening, good and bad, yeah. ugly and beautiful, and everything in between, to just have eyes to see what is. What's true about here and now? And that's a terrifying question. It's a terrifying thing to to look at because many of of us will will be moments in our life where, where we need to see what's actually happening in our marriages, but we don't want to see it because if we see it, then we need to address it. We, We might need to actually stop for a moment and see what is going on in our community to see what is going on on 16th and 17th Street downtown with so many people who are affected by homelessness. I don't want to see that. Well, because if you see it, then you might be responsible to do something with it. And so many of us, we're channel changers. We'll just, we don't like what we see on the channel. We'll just change the channel. And we live our lives that way because it's more safe. It's more safe. And I think if, if you really want to begin to gain a vision for your life, you be, have to start with seeing what is. And this is where, where Nehemiah begins. He, he says, what, what's going on over there? What, what's happening in that place? And I think that's where you need to begin is what is. What is true about your relationships? What's true about your neighborhood? What's true about your city? What is? And I think if we can just use this as, as a metaphor, what, uh, as this building and this campaign that, that we're stepping into as a community, it's so nice for us to have a home for those of us who come from the Maker's Church side of things. Ten years almost, we're migratory all over the city, setting up and tearing down. And, and, and it, so it's so easy to come into a place like this and just go, this is great. I mean, we've got a home. Not only is it a home, but it's, it's paid for outright. And it's like, man, this is great. I, I'm, I love it. But if you start looking at what is, we, we know that this building and this, the history of this church, it's rich in history. It's rich in history. But it's poor in integrity. Not the people, the building. 
The building is literally falling in on itself. You're fine in this room. <laughs> but there are parts of this building that, that will collapse if we don't address it. Roofs that will fall in on themselves if we don't fix them. Water that will seep in and, and, and undermine the entire integrity of the building. There's so many things that need to be addressed. And so just using this as a metaphor, as an example of seeing what is, you begin to get a clear view. And it begins to shape a picture and a vision for the future. I've always been inspired, and one of the places I've always wanted to go is, is the Great Wall in China. It's just this amazing wonder of the world. And I, I love this the, the idea of it, and I, I hate to say it, but I feel like I don't need to go there anymore because I've fully nerded out on Google Earth, and I've been there. I've, like, I've followed all 4,500 miles of, of the wall, um, and I've, I've, I've seen it with my own eyes on my phone. <laughs> and I've just always been intrigued by it. 4,500 miles long, and... 13 feet wide and impenetrable. And the thing that always has amazed me the most about that wonder of the world is that at one point, it was just one man's vision. It was just an idea in somebody's mind. But he took that, that vision. He took that vision and he saw what was, and he began to answer that question, the second lens that we need to lean into, which is what should be. What should be. So we move from what is to what should be. And whatever was going on in the, in the world at that time, the, the Babylonians and the Mongolians and everybody who was threatening the country, he saw this is what is, and then the what should be is what answered that question. And he took this idea from his mind and he, he was able to take his sphere of influence and he led people to build that wall. It took a million Chinese people 10 years to build that wall. It didn't exist at one point, but it came out of the bridge between what is and what should be. And along the way, I think what can really start to confuse us and start to distract us is the question of what could be. See, what could be, there, there's a million options, there's a million ideas, there's a million things, but if you begin to shake through it all, there's this, this thing that bubbles to the surface and it moves from what could be to what should be. What is the next right thing to do? A should be vision, it, it connects you to the purpose. And when things get tiresome and when things get difficult and when things get hard, it's the should-be vision that keeps you going. Yeah. I can only imagine how difficult it was to build a 4,500-mile-long wall. But the, the idea, the purpose behind it is what kept them going. And when things get difficult, when you're connected to a should-be lens in your vision, it begins to give fuel and motivation to you along the way. See, there's a lot of things as we answered the question about what could we do with this space. Million opportunities, million ideas. Sell it, trade it, tear it down, rebuild it, um, reuse it, turn it into this or that. So many could be's. But the should be became clear that this should become a beacon of hope, an iconic source of inspiration and creativity. A home for people who have never found a home. A place where, where people can find faith and grow their faith in Jesus. And the, the gap between what is and what should be begins to start filling in some of our strategy. And the third lens is to not only see what is and what should be, but to see yourself as a difference maker. To see yourself as the difference maker. See, there's a difference between dreamers and visionaries. Dreamers say something needs to change. You ever heard that before? Yeah. Something needs to change. But visionaries say, I need to change something. Yeah. Dreamers say something needs to change. But visionaries say, 
I need to change something. A dreamer has creativity and can imagine it. But a visionary has the courage to take action. And in order for you to, to gain a, a view of what the, the vision is for your life, we take those lenses of what is and what should be, and we begin to see ourselves as difference makers, as those who can actually do something about it. And some of you, you've identified so many things that need to change. You've identified so many things that need to, to happen in this world or in that world. I mean, we sit around the, the coffee table at the firehouse where I work, and we solve all the problems of the fire department over a cup of coffee. Yes. Yes. You know, what, what, what should be, and I, I, I think this should happen and that should happen. But as soon as you say to somebody, cool, what are you going to do about it? Yeah. It takes on a whole new level of challenge. And so maybe you've been praying for God, God, would you do something in this city about this or about that? What if your, your prayer began to shift and you say, God, would you do something in me to help me be a response to that, to be an initiator, to be somebody who's going to take the influence I have and use it to lead others towards something better? And last but not least, we take those three lenses and we add the fourth most important one. To see what is, to see what should be, to see ourselves as difference makers. But man, we can't make much of a difference until we see the greatness of our God. In Nehemiah 1.5, it says, he said, I said, I beseech you, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who preserves the covenant and loving kindness for those who love him and keep his commandments. See, sometimes our vision's not all that great because our vision is only what we're capable of achieving on our own. And that's just not all that impressive. But when we see a great and mighty God who we serve, we begin to gain a God-sized vision because we don't look at what's possible but through our sacrifice or what's possible through our hard work, but we look at what's possible through the great I am, the great provider, a great and mighty God. And when that lens clicks into place, all of a sudden we get a God-sized vision. And that vision should scare the crap out of you. Because in order to see it come to pass, it requires that God comes and moves. I think the most important part about this vision when we get it is that we follow in the footsteps of what Nehemiah and what so many others have done. Is they take that vision and they go to God in prayer, in fasting. And they, they, they test it against, God, is this really the vision? Is this just a great idea or is this the vision you've given me? And two things happen when you do that, when you go to God in prayer is not only does he mature the vision, not only does he sharpen the vision, not only does he, does he curate the ideas that are happening inside of you and begin to make it clear, he doesn't just mature the vision, but he matures the visionary. If you know me, you know that I'm fire, ready, aim in my approach to life. Uh, taking... Nehemiah prayed for four months about this vision. Four months he prayed about this vision. And it was in that praying that God reinforced and re-inspired and re-sharpened the clarity of that vision. And that's exactly what God has been doing in us as a church over the last year. Just sharpening, just reframing, refocusing a vision for us. And my prayer is that God would do the same in you, that you would spend the next 30 days, and this is my challenge for you, that you'd spend the next 30 days praying this prayer, reading through the book of Nehemiah, being inspired by the way God moved through him to effect change, to do great things, and say, God, what vision do you have for me? 
and take that vision and, and keep praying about it. Pray with others. Pray in your community groups. Pray in your families. Pray with your wives and your husbands and your kids. Say, God, what do you want to do in me and through me? And that's what I want to invite you to this morning. Would you pray with me? God, I just thank you, Lord, for every person here in the building, God, for every person who's watching online and every person who will re-watch this in the days to come. And God, my prayer is that for each and every person here, God, that even right now, you'd begin to inspire them with a vision that comes from you. God, that you'd clarify their purpose and you'd give them a fresh vision for this next season of their life. And I got that pray, I pray that in that process of you reshaping and reframing and giving fresh vision to each one of them, that you'd help them all see that they're leaders, that they have influence, that they have power, that they have resource, that they have friends and family, God, that you've entrusted to them to have influence over. And I just pray, God, that you'd use them to make an impact in their sphere, to be for good to bring positive change, to bring hope and healing and life and love, whatever the vision is that you give them. God, it's so easy for us to come and sit in a pew and say, uh, Pastor, what's the vision of our, of our church? But God, the reality is, is we are your church. And God, whatever vision you put inside of each and every one of us, God, becomes the vision for our church. And so, God, I just pray that you would move mightily in their lives this morning. And in these next 30 days. And so, God, I just pray that you would speak and that we would listen and that you would clarify for us the right next step. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. You are listening to the Maker's Church Podcast. For more information about our community, please visit makerschurch.org.